So um, I want to welcome everyone who is joining us today um, for this session. I believe the keynote probably just ended. Um, so here we are in the Makerspaces conference. And the first thing that they'd like us to go through, um, if you have any trouble, Lacey is on hand, our wonderful moderator. You can type any questions you have in the chat box if you're having technical difficulty. Um, if you have a question and you need um, you would like, I will try to pause throughout the presentation for questions. I will try to remember to do that once I get going. It's hard for me to stop. So Lacey, please do jump in um, if I need to stop and explain or answer any questions. Uh, the next slide we will go to is founding partners. We, of course, want to thank the sponsors of events like this profusely for their support and for their organizing of them. I especially appreciate uh, learning opportunities that are online. I can do them from my desk. I can do them from libraries, which we are no, we all know are hard to get away from uh, the reference desk and programming and everybody's very busy. So this is a wonderful platform and opportunity for us to share what we're doing with literally professionals all around the country and the world. So thank you very much to our partners and we certainly hope that they continue to put on great events. And okay, so our recording is started. So I'm going to jump right in and introduce myself. So this session is called From Zero to System-Wide Makerspace in three grants and four years. My name is Rebecca Ferrer, and I am a youth services librarian in uh, Stamford, Connecticut. And I will get to where that is. Here we are. Here is Stanford. Um, for those of you who have not been to New England or, or overseas, Connecticut is that tiny little red dot uh, just to the right of New York and just below Massachusetts. We're not a large state, but we are mighty. Um, Stanford is the third largest city in the state of Connecticut. We have a population of about 130,000 people, and we are located 30 miles or about 48 kilometers. Um, north of New York City, so it's it's a wonderful uh, area to be in. We're close to the publishing industry. We have a lot of kind of back and forth with New York City and all that goes on there. So we're really fortunate to be located where we are in the book world. So that's a little bit about Stanford. Um, I have been a librarian here for 13 years and in the greater metropolitan area of New York City for around 15 years. So that's how long I've been sort of up in up in this area, and I really enjoy it. From Pennsylvania originally, so if any of you are in PA, say hey to my home state. Uh, so about the Ferguson Library, uh, we are Stanford's public library. Uh, we are a five-branch system. The photo here is the original part, the old part of our main library branch. Um, the Ferguson has been in Stanford for over 130 years. Uh, we have 45,000 active library cards. We have a large educational system, 13 public elementary schools, five middle schools, three public high schools, campuses for three different universities, and an untold number, I'm not even sure how many private schools um, there are, but there are definitely, there's a definitely an active private school uh, community in Stanford. So we're a very busy urban library, but our four branches are in, they kind of sprawl out through our residential areas and there's a lot of diversity in Stanford. It's an incredibly diverse city, um, economically, culturally, and we have a lot of different types of needs to meet and people to serve. So it's, it's been great. It's a real learning experience to, to work in a library of this size. So I just wanted to go over a little bit of how we here at the Ferguson got into makerspaces and libraries. Um, I began doing some technology training for our staff uh, beginning in around 2007 when social media was on the rise, when um, iPhones came out, when tablets started to be a thing, the Kindle dropped and everybody panicked a little bit and thought, oh no, everything's digital, books are dead, print is dead, libraries are going to go away. Which as we found uh, did not happen. Print is still a very robust uh, market and people are reading more than ever and using libraries more than ever. So that's sort of how um, we made the philosophical shift about our library. We needed to rethink what the library was. Should we have it be, as it has been historically, a repository for all of the ideas and, and books and knowledge that we've had? 
and did we need to shift that idea to be a place that drives innovation forward to create um, new ideas in the library to to have it be a place where ideas are formed and implemented and for the library to become a space that helps drive innovation into the future as a way to keep us relevant in our current society. So um, the release of the first consumer level 3D printers sort of coincided with that shift in our service model and that really gave us an opportunity to get our foot in the door to be kind of the, the point organization for our community where people find that technology. So it became apparent, apparent with that growth that new professional positions were going to be required at the library for to focus on a new aspect of our patrons' lives, of our patrons' education, and to keep us as a relevant support and means of discovery for these new technologies, obviously at no cost at the public library, um, for the public. So we'll go through in uh, a couple slides in a couple years how we manage to do that. So year one would be 2014. That is when we decided that we were going to create a makerspace in the library. We started in new services. We thought it was a good beta testing area to see um, is there a need for this and will the public respond to it. So as with any new initiative in libraries, the first thing you have to find is the money. Budgets are very tight and budgets are constantly being strained. Um, I don't think Connecticut still has a state budget as, as of this recording. So we really have to work with the powers that be and what's provided um, as support from our local governments. So we had a grant opportunity. We have a local bank, First County Bank, which has been a really reliable um, support in our local community of funding uh, library initiatives with grant money since around 2002. So we have a great relationship with them that goes back a long time since before I was even at this library. Um, so there is a First County Bank grant that we apply for basically every year we're sort of one of the you know one of the organizations that goes for their support and we've been able to use that fairly consistent funding source to develop a lot of our technology over the past five years or so so there is the only picture of me with a big check that will probably happen um, in my life so I kept it and that was our first county bank grant check from 2014 Stanford actually hosts several companies um, in the city that have really great literacy initiatives. There's a financial advisory corporation called KPMG and they actually have a literacy wing of their company that they really focus on making that a community impact. So they provide us with volunteers to read to children in the summertime and they provide some funds for us to have books to give away to young children who attend story times. So we're very fortunate in Stanford that there are businesses that have, you know, the need for literacy and education on their minds. So the Youth Services Coordinator, my, my direct supervisor in Youth Services and, and myself wrote a grant in 2014 called Make Way for Makerspaces, bringing makerspace technology for tweens and teens to the Ferguson Library. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, grant anxiety a little later, which I definitely had. I did not have any experience writing grants and uh, working with someone else on the first one was a great way to kind of dip your toe in the water. So we requested funding to create a space for children to learn maker skills, experimentation, and play, and also to become familiar with new technologies such as 3D printers, CAD design software, electronics, and robotics. We also place an emphasis on traditional technology skills like sewing with a needle and thread, drawing, painting, weaving, printmaking, because I really felt that to learn new technology, you sort of need to understand where innovation comes from. And so we wanted to build on foundation skills. So those traditional maker skills in order to, um, you sort of need those to be able to build into the technology of the future. So we had a real range from very old things, I would say the things that, you know, you might have learned from your grandparents and then all the way up to CAD design and 3D printing. So we weren't leaving out any sort of steps in history. Um, and my position, my current position of a digital librarian was created by the library to specifically support uh, the makerspace initiative that the library was into and a position was added in the adult department as well. So that we have a digital librarian in the adult department and in youth services. 
let's go. Oh, sorry, that just, there we go. So next, where to put our makerspace? This is an especial challenge in public libraries and school library buildings. Um, they tend to be very defined spaces with no real room for growth or expansion. So we have a multi-purpose program room that I am sitting in right now. Uh, it's just a few hundred square feet. It's not large, and we use it for everything. We use it for story time, craft programs, class visits, department meetings, um, and it has, as you can see from the photo, one kind of long wall and one half wall toward the entrance of the room. We were able to build in counters and cabinets along the length of the room and along that half wall, and we installed electrical outlets about every two feet, and we set up dedicated Wi-Fi for the room. Now, the laptops that you see in the photo, those were donated to us through a local company that upgraded their technology. So they gave them to the library, and we said, yes, absolutely, we'll take them. We also have uh, 12 donated iPads that we use in makerspace programming for kids. We did um, an app art program, and we have a bunch of you know, sort of creative ways to use app technology with kids. And so with that initial grant, we were able to purchase our first equipment to get the makerspace started. And in, you can see in that second photo, our first acquisitions were um, a fifth generation MakerBot 3D printer. We bought the full size one and then we bought uh, the mini, which is, I like to call it our travel model. So if I'm going out to schools or training teachers or I've trained the media specialists in Stanford Public Schools, that's the guy that I can take with me pretty easily. We take them to, you know, maker fairs, hackathons, that kind of thing. So that's our travel model, 3D printer. Um, we purchased a Little Bits classroom kit. We purchased several types of hand tools and workshop supplies and a lot of maker project kits that we used for programming for that first summer. And I'll have some examples of those in a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> So we focused on that middle grade age range in order to test out several things. One, if there was interest in the community for this type of programming, there was a lot. The audience was ready and waiting. The next was, uh, what was the appropriate age for maker type programming? <coughs> Excuse me. We seem to have found the target range for comprehension and ability with the types of projects we started with. And for three, we wanted to find for basic safety. We developed a user agreement for kids interacting with the 3D printer, and we wanted a common sense guide to safety and supervision. And they use hand tools and some heat guns and some other things that we just wanted them to be on par with. And as we were just starting out, we also used some of the grant money to pay programmers to come in and teach some of the skills we were not able to do yet in-house. That's another thing about having a makerspace is you don't necessarily have to be an expert in everything. If there's something that you don't know how to do, more than likely you, find some, you can find someone who knows how to do it. For example, one of the best suggestions I can make to you is to find out what the hobbies of your staff and colleagues are. Because I had a part-time librarian who worked with us who was, <coughs> excuse me, a master knitter. And we have a maintenance staff member who is an expert flower arranger. So you don't know what people are doing in their everyday lives. And those are going to be the first ones that you can pull in to help instruct in a makerspace. So survey your colleagues. <coughs> excuse me to find out what their hobbies and hidden expertise are. Because I guarantee you have some <clears throat> in your organization. The third uh, slide there is when we took it outside. When you start a new program like this, if you have new technology, one of the best things you can do is leave the building. So there was a parking, what they called a parking day event in Stanford where a bunch of organizations took what they, <coughs> excuse me, what they wanted to promote out to the sidewalk and we spoke to, I want to say, 300 people in a little under two hours just by going outside the doors of the building. So if you're starting a new initiative, go outside and definitely promote it. Next. This is an example um, of the brochure. In that first summer, we offered a six-week series of programming for kids called Maker Mondays. 
And we offered workshops where they could make things like solar powered robots and LED wearables by using conductive thread to sew LED lights into clothes. And a series on learning to use a free online CAD design program called Tinkercad to design for 3D printing. Every program was filled and there were wait lists for all of them. And our program room turned to Makerspace gave us just enough room for 12 to 15 kids, which is a good size if the projects require some hands-on help from adults. And a lot of times they do, especially if you're working with that 9 to 12 age range. So I often recruited uh, one of my full-time colleagues to be an extra set of hands to help with the projects, um, but they all were able to complete them no problem. And our summer series was so successful, we decided to continue monthly makerspace programming for then on, which we still do. We have a Raspberry Pi program for kids that we're doing this month. So this brochure is actually from 2015, but it gives you an idea of the types of things, um, everything from com computer coding to knitting to, you know, duct tape flip-flops, which were a huge hit, I must say. I still have my pair. They hold up pretty well. So year two, um, with the continued support of First County Bank, we were able to sort of trade off this grant between the Youth Services Department and the Adult Department. So for the second year, we decided to utilize the momentum that we had gained with this successful programming for kids, and our Adult Department applied for the next iteration of the grant. So the same project was expanded uh, the next year into the Adult Computer Lab. They followed the same model that we used uh, in building the space. Luckily, we had rooms we could do this. They built counters and cabinets along open wall spaces and added modular tables to create workspace as needed. They purchased a Lulzbot 3D printer, uh, hand tool kits, as you can see there, which they actually circulate to the public. People love them. They brought a uh, quite a few types of musical instruments. That kit uh, shown is one of the ukuleles that you can borrow from the library. And they purchased cameras and recording equipment and they took a storage closet in the third floor computer lab and turned it into a recording studio. Also a new position of makerspace librarian was created in the adult department uh, to focus on developing the space and the programming around it. And you can see our two librarians there with the VR headsets on. The one on your left is Frank, he's the Makerspace Librarian, and the one on the right is Jason, and he is our, or sorry, Frank is the Digital Librarian, Jason is the Makerspace Librarian. So they are two of our permanent full-time staff now. Also, full lists of the equipment and classes that I'm discussing are available through the related links on the program description on the Library 2.0 website. So if you go to the page for my talk, the links to those pages that will list everything I'm referring to are available on that page. So additional funding. Um, the, the original grant was great to get us built and get us started and get us up and running. But then once it became a successful program, we could use some extra set of hands. So in 2016, the library applied for a separate grant from <clears throat> the Fairfield County Community Foundation, which is an organization founded to support local charities and nonprofits in the community. The awarding of this grant allowed the library to hire four makerspace specific interns, two high school students and two college students working toward technology fields in their studies, to do a paid internship for one year in the library makerspaces. This staffing enabled us to open up the makerspaces for a total of 12 hours a week when the public could just drop in and learn and experiment with the technology available. So we could refer to these as our open hours, which is great, and these continue now <clears throat> in the Youth Services Makerspace, that schedule is our current schedule, and Chance Clark is our, he's our UConn student, he was our intern that we hired him on as a part-time employee after that grant ended because he was a digital media student, so he had animation and video gaming experience, but had never touched a 3D printer till he came to us. And now he can take the thing apart to the ground and put it back together. Just an amazing kid. So we're really happy to um, have had the opportunity to advance his skills. He's really taken a leadership role. He's run some programs for us, and it's been a great opportunity for both of us. So the interns were managed by the digital librarians who also oversaw the open hours and dealt with any issues that may come up. We trained them on working with and the maintenance of the 3D printers <clears throat> and any other technology 
So they're able to troubleshoot now and problem solve any hardware issues. And like I said, at the end of the grant, we ended up keeping uh, both of the college students on as part-time employees. So year three. This is uh, the next opportunity for youth services to apply for the First County Bank grant. And the, their loyal support of the library initiatives is really what has made all of this possible over the past four years. So for the 2016 grant, we wrote a proposal to expand our offerings in the youth makerspace. We wanted to buy more open source and less proprietary than the MakerBot 3D printers um, with open operating systems, more customizable software. We added two more machines to the Makerspace, the LulzBot Mini and the Ultimaker 3D that you can see there. Um, supplies and programming materials, craft materials, and we were able to provide some of those to our branch libraries as well. And we made it a specific goal in the 2016 grant to expand our programming beyond the original age range demographic of 9 to 12 years old. So we began offering program to children as young as 6. Things like tabletop coding and board game design, um, and we expanded it all the way up through high school. We had really successful iMovie workshops with teens, and we recently, last month I think, did a 3D printing class for teens where they learned to use Tinkercad. And with the original efforts, we found enthusiastic audiences at every age that we targeted, and even we've had adults really pushing to sign up for some of our kids programming because you know their interest in the topic or the skill instruction that we had on offer so luckily we have maker spaces for kids and adults so we're able to cover everybody's interest level also september 2016 was the first of what has become an annual event for the library it was our first maker fair so we hosted uh we branded it the Ferguson Make Fest in the two lower photos there. Uh, we set up all of our wares out in front of the building on a beautiful September day last year. And last month, we just uh, had our second annual Maker Fair. We invited local makers and crafters, mostly people we had partnered with through programming, other local Maker Fairs, hackathons, coding events. And the event has, has run over 600 people each time so we're pretty happy with that and it grew from the first year to the second year so we're hoping it's going to be a continuing annual event and we put that event on with mostly internal staff and at a very low cost so we haven't had to find any additional funding to put on the maker fair so far this year in 2017, the First County Grant was awarded to the Adult Department to support their efforts at expanding their tech-based initiatives that came out of building their makerspace. In 2016, the library partnered with a local tech startup company and established the first ever virtual reality lab in the library. To our knowledge, this was the first of its kind on the East Coast in the United States and one of the first in the country. They installed cutting edge VR technology in a designated space in the library. That room that you see there is one of our meeting rooms on the third floor right next to the computer lab that houses the makerspace. And they have the HTC Vive, Google Earth VR, several headsets that can utilize your phone. And at our maker fair last month, they um, invited, there's a company that has a Microsoft HoloLens in Stanford Town Center, which is right across the street from us. So they brought that as part of our Maker Faire and people were really impressed with that as well. Um, we're looking at building on to our technology for what we have in the, the VR lab. I think we're looking at the new kind of self-contained headsets that are coming out this November. I think we're going to purchase some of those. So we're definitely um, going to be expanding those offerings. But we've had no problems with this hardware so far. Um, the, that blurb right there is straight from our calendar. There are open hours for the VR lab every week that all ages can come and experience it. We have families, kids, grandparents, um, and everybody's had a really good experience with it. Um, so they continue in the adult department to offer a robust schedule of maker programming for adults, everything from arts and crafts programs to monthly podcast workshop to coding with Raspberry Pi is going to be on offer next month and many other computer-based skill classes. So our plan going forward, well, my plan going forward, um, so 2018 will be the Youth Service Department's next turn to apply for the First County Bank Grant. That will be our third one 
in five years um, that we'll be dedicating, you know, to the maker initiative. And as the manager of the maker space, I have plans for where we want to expand in the coming year. We have very well established the maker space in the main library. Um, and it services the, the main library is the largest branch of our system and we feel it's time to expand those services to the rest of the community. So for the 2018 grant, um, which is not written yet, but we're going to start on soon, is to create a makerspace in each of our four branch libraries. Space is obviously a concern at some locations, but the great thing about a makerspace is that it can be mobile. All you really need is a book cart with you know, some technology and supplies on it, or even a sturdy tote bag. If you're on the move, I have moved a 3D printer in a tote bag. It can be done. Um, we also want to use some funding to free up some staffing time so that we can go to the branches and train all the staff there so they can operate autonomously of the main library and create their own homes for their tech that they have there. And Stanford is uh, 36 square miles, so it's not convenient really or feasible for all of our patrons and all of our neighborhoods to get to the main library downtown and to take advantage, you know, of all the, the gear and training. And it's part of the library's mission to meet our patrons where they are and to make efforts to bridge any type of socioeconomic or digital divide that they may be facing in their life circumstances. And for all of the makerspace training, the products, the use of the 3D printers, the filament, um, we charge for none of it. Absolutely everything that we offer is free. We have not had to charge for anything and um, don't plan to anytime in the near future. So it makes, you know, accessibility uh, a pretty free and equal issue. So um, just to sum up, uh, Suggestions I could make for funding, look for local grant opportunities. Um, we were very fortunate to have First County Bank nearby. It's a, you know, a business that has a history in Stanford. The library has a history in Stanford, so it was a great partnership. You can always look for um, LSTA grants. That's the Library Service and Technology Grants. Um, IMLS grants, that's the Institute of Museum and Libraries. There are community foundations and local businesses who may just be looking for you know, a good, a good initiative in the community to support. Um, recently, we even considered a National Science Foundation grant because um, it was to support STEM programming. So we met with some people. It was a big grant. It would have been a big undertaking, but, you know, leave no stone unturned when you're looking for funding. Um, for a long time, I was very intimidated by the grant writing process. It took sort of jumping in with both feet with a partner uh, to realize that it's something I can do. I haven't written a full one on my own. I will someday, but I found out that I really enjoyed uh, the way that you look at a project when you prepare a grant for it. The task is laid out step by step with a timeline and measurable ways to show your success. And it makes for a really organized project and it's less overwhelming when you can see it from start to finish. Um, think about resources you have on hand. Make sure you know, you know, what, what your friends, neighbors, and colleagues do in their spare time. They have skills you had no idea that you can always make use of in a makerspace. Um, and don't be intimidated by lack of, lack of space in your building or in your library because you really can make a makerspace anywhere. It doesn't have to be a concrete, you know, corner. It can be wherever you need to be. Um, and to make connections in your community. Uh, we meet a lot of people passing by um, in professional meetings, visiting schools, uh, and every person you meet can be a potential partner. I took a, a soldering class at a local uh, makerspace just for my own interest and met a bunch of people that were able to come and teach some drone classes and things at the library. So networking with local makers um, is good advice. Uh, anything else? I think that's it. If anyone has any questions, thank you very much for listening. I know that was a lot of information, uh, but I just wanted to share how we did it, if it would be helpful to anyone else. I did see one question down here. Um, we had Annalisa ask if you, if your library charges are any missing parts, if something comes up like in the circulating hand tool kits, if it's missing a hammer when it gets checked in. That is a very good question. I think we generally hand that, handle that um, as we would any missing item, say it's a book and CD or any other library item that has a missing part, there will probably be some sort of, in you can replace it in kind, um, but I think we try to, you know, avoid large cost replacements. 
that makes sense. We do that too. If you're dismissing a part and you can find right. it on Amazon, bring it in. Same <laughs> with a book. If, if, you, if the book goes into the bathtub, find us another copy. No harm done. Awesome. Um, it looks like there's a couple other questions down here. Mary is asking, um, what was the VR headset that you mentioned? Uh, that we have in our makerspace. We have the HTC Vive. Um, we have Google Earth VR, which I think you can stream through any device, and um, just several of the, we have the Google Cardboard headsets, and I think the one that Samsung made that you just put your phone right in. Um, however, the, that list of equipment, if you look at the links that are attached to the proposal, the description for this talk, you can click on those links and the full list of, of gear that's available in that makerspace will be available there. Awesome. And then uh, we have a question from Catherine, if there is isn't any age limit or waiver forms for the VR room? Not for VR, no. Nope, it's all ages. Nope, we haven't had any trouble. I personally um, can't do very much VR. It tends to make me motion sick, but we haven't run into any problems with the public. People seem awesome. to love it. Yeah. That's awesome. And then we have a question from Hannah, and she's asking, mm -hmm. how long did it take to write the big STEM grant that you talked about for the National Science Foundation? That grant, it was a very quick turnaround time. We actually met with some people um, at at the University of Connecticut to see if it, it was feasible. It, they wanted a turnaround in about two months, but they also wanted research partners and they wanted extensive documentation. It sort of was going to build on education, education research that had already happened. So we felt that the turnaround time was too quick for us. But, um, you know, you want to look at the size of your grant. Like, obviously, the local grant, it takes us I mean, a week or two to write it, and the turnaround is not terribly bad, but you do want to be aware of how much work you're getting into as far as reporting, um, you know, partnerships that you may be required, back matter that you may be required to provide. So that's always something to keep in mind when looking for a grant. But I can say that the National Science Foundation, the manual alone for writing the grant was about, it was less than 100 pages, but at least 80. But that's government money. Yes, that's how that works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we do have one other one. Um, uh, what would you say is the hardest part about starting makerspaces in multiple branch libraries? Oh, I'm about to find that out in 2018. Um, I think probably, I'm not going to say it's going to be the hardest part, but it's going to take um, some persistence is, is in multiple branch libraries, you have multiple administrations, you have multiple managers, you have multiple staff with levels of comfort with this type of thing. So I think um, sort of getting everyone on board and explaining that this is not insurmountable. Because some people look at technology and think, I can't do that. You know what I mean? I didn't grow up with computers. I can't do that. I've actually done some training at some of our branches already on just what is 3D printing and what are makerspaces and just kind of taking taking the unknown out of it. So it's going to it's going to take some legwork, I think, to get everybody on board and to show them that it it absolutely is possible to get comfortable with this and this is a service that we can all provide to the public. So probably just that initial hump of I'm I don't know enough to feel confident with this. Um, that and finding space and I would say after your grant runs out, finding, you know, money in the budget to continue those services. So some creative accounting sometimes is necessary. Like where do we take away from to inject more money into this initiative that we're trying to get off the ground? Okay. And branching off of that question, um, are the branches in your system empowered to write their own grants or does it have to come through a, like a main source? No, they are absolutely empowered to write their own grants. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, if, if there's something that they want to do that's branch specific, I we have a really, really supportive administration and we rarely, you know, there is no kind of central office that needs to be funneled through. Depending on the size of the grant, we do have a grant writer sort of on staff part time. So if we need help and advice, that person is there that we can go to. But if, if somebody at a branch wants to take the reins on that and, and go for a project, I, that's really encouraged. Awesome. All righty. Well, I, uh, my current time is 329, so if anybody has any other quick questions that we can answer, that would be awesome. Otherwise, um, I think we're good to go. I thought this was a super 
informative <laughs> program. Thank I you so really much. This was my my first uh, webinar presentation, so I hope I didn't talk too fast. I had a lot of info to get through, and just thank you everybody for listening. Awesome. All righty. Well, I, I looks like everybody is kind of getting ready to. <laughs> you found yourself a new Twitter follower for sure. <laughs> oh, great! Yes, I'm at Rablaga on Twitter. Please follow me. I'm all library related. Um, and FergusonLibrary.org. Um, is my library's website. If you have any, you know, questions or want to find out more about our system and the, the like I said, the Makerspace pages are linked to the, the overview of this talk on the library.